Welcome to The Visible Artist. My name is Sophie Loxton Lucas, and I'm delighted to bring you this extra special Art World edition this week. I travel to Camberwell to chat to Oki McGill in her gallery space, Blue Shop Cottage. The mantra of the gallery is help artists grow. So I wanted to find out what that means to Oki and how she creates this community around that. Oki talked about the exhibitions the gallery hosts and the residency program and even the design details that she uses to capture and build the identities around the exhibitions and even the artists themselves. It's a really fun and friendly conversation and Oki is truly inspiring with her passion for supporting very early career artists. So I do hope you enjoy this conversation. Hi everyone and welcome to today's episode. I am delighted to be sitting here with a true champion of emerging artists, Oki McGill, in her wonderful Blue Shop Cottage. Part gallery, part workshop space and part home for Oki, Blue Shop Cottage is an inspiring energetic space in Camberwell that showcases the work of up and coming British artists. Oki is incredibly talented in so many ways, creating a thriving artist community, managing a successful business, sourcing talented artists and creating a beautiful identity for Blue Shop Cottage. She recently posted some very impressive statistics about the past year. The gallery has showed 107 artists, 11 artists on residency programs, 15 shows in the gallery, <clears throat> over 400, artwork, 400 artworks sold, eight female artists to Sotheby's and more. And this is really quite amazing given the current climate. Clearly her motto of help artists grow is working and I can't wait to hear more about it. Beyond all of these stats, I'm a huge fan of the artists that Oki chooses to work with. Rose Electra Harris, Alice Hartley, Jess Allen, to name but a few. She clearly has an eye for talented artists and I look forward to chatting about how she chooses her very lucky artists. So, Oki, thank you so much for having me in the gallery. Welcome. That was such a nice introduction. <laughs> I feel like when you run a business, when you're so immersed in something, you it's only you get rare opportunities to take stock of the things. And actually, last night at midnight, when I was sort of working out those stats, it's only then truly that you think, okay, we've done well. We've done we've done a good job. So yeah, welcome, welcome, and thanks for. Thanks for taking the time to chat to us. Well, it's great to be sitting here in the gallery. I've seen so many pictures online. It's got the iconic awning and the works. There's so many works in here at the moment. Mm-hmm. Um, it, you must feel when you walk into the space, just seeing all these artworks and these artists that you're helping a lot of people. Yeah, and that's. I think that's what it's been about from the beginning. Um, my background was in brand design, art direction, and um, and it didn't. Those jobs didn't focus for me enough around people. And having grown up with artists, studied with artists, lived with artists, it felt like it was a perfect way, like to lend my skill set to helping other people. Hence the the tagline and that and that motto: help artists grow is what sort of re-centers me as an individual, as a creative person. Um, so to be surrounded by all these artists here, both in the gallery that we sit in currently, but also in my home and in the Blue Shop like permanent collection, um, it's all about supporting talented young artists and doing whatever we can to, to support them in their growth and in their careers, yeah. Well, I certainly want to talk a lot more about that, but perhaps we'll go back <clears throat> to the beginning of your journey. How did you get to this point that you're running this beautiful gallery? So that is a question I get asked quite a lot. And, <laughs> and, and the short answer is by accident, basically. <laughs> but I have always had put on sort of things on the side of things. So I used to live in this crazy house up in Camden and we'd put on art exhibitions and big like theatrical events and obviously parties and things and um, because I've always just found creative people and artists you know so engaging I think when you work in proper like ad industries and big sort of run-of-the-mill agencies you just you're just seeking that sort of joie and you get that from from creatives and from artists and basically I was I had a design agency in um, Peckham which I was loving I was doing sort of amusingly sort of dog dog food branding for Morrison's and uh, <laughs> toothpaste branding for Whole Foods um, sort of to name a few and it was great but it was missing 
that you know the people the, the warmth of people and anyway I was looking for a a flat at the time and I've never liked living in the sort of standard flat setup I've always lived in quite sort of quirky houses anyway I found this shop for sale and it was um well I won't swear but it was der- <laughs> derelict very <laughs> derelict <laughs> um and I was assured by friends and family that it it simply couldn't be lived in and it was it was not the one for me but I just had this vision of this you know this live work space we could use the shop to to rent out to, to artists makers and so we did that for a few months but actually um, wanting creative control on, on all things um, sort of took over. And, and so we had our first show, which was Rose Electra Harris in, in 2018. And it just, it was one of those moments that I just stood back. We had, you know, hundreds of people outside. Rose was so happy. I'd done all the film, the artwork. There were just hordes of people having a good time, buying their first piece of artwork. And it just, I was like, this is it. Whatever this is, this is it. And that and that was the start of, of yeah, Blue Shot Cottage, where we are now. Yeah, and how has it been going since then? Well, it's I mean it, I have to say it has really been a ride. You know, it's I think it's easy, as we all know, to look at Instagram and and things seem so sort of you know, they just sort of appear. But it's 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 really hard work. And I think it's really hard work when you're doing business to try and stay true to being a good business and you know Mary Portas talks about this about you know this kindness economy and that's something that is integral to us we want to make sure we pay artists well we treat them well we look after curators we're doing good business and basically that is hard but it's been amazing the lockdown whilst we had to show, um, close our current show at the time, which is Dominic McHenry, his stunning show, Ballpoint. So there were many tears shed. <laughs> but I was told by my, my siblings that um, to get some perspective, and they're absolutely right. <laughs> but because it's just me here, at the time it was just me, we were able to sort of, you know, spin around on the sixpence and go, okay, what are we going to do? So we went online and we did our artist interviews every day. Um, I mean, I only counted the ones that I did this year and I think that was 55. So God knows yeah. how many interviews I did with artists. And I'm, I mean, for some of them, I was fairly intoxicated because I did them every <laughs> single day. So on the Saturday, yeah. Um, but yeah, it's been an incredible ride. And I think now, sort of more than ever, now we're kind of looking to get to that next step. We're looking for a new space. We've got some a wonderful team behind us. We we employ sort of between ten and fifteen young artists, creatives who sort of support our business here. We have really firm relationships with our suppliers, and you know it's just exciting to think about the next stage. But so far, so good, and I just feel very lucky to do what we do here. I think a lot of what you've said will really resonate with people. And of course, everyone, lots of people have these dreams of creating something with an artist community and supporting people and paying people well. But it's hard to actually make that work as a business. You can have all these ideas, but you've actually made it work financially, which is very impressive. Yeah, and we've that's that's we've had to do that because I think when you when you find something that you love, like really love and it ticks all your boxes in terms of job satisfaction, that like you're happy to stay up until 3am at night doing something. I mean, I get real kicks from doing that when I'm loading <laughs> up works on paper because I believe in it. You know, my sort of, the people that I look up to, you know, the Peggy Guggenheims, the Barbara Hepworths, the, you know, these incredible artists, these, fem- these female people who've like changed things you know, you dedicate yourself to something and, um, and yeah, the community aspect, interestingly. So when we're looking for our new space, I was thinking, you know, how important is that bit that people can come and hang out here, you know, because a lot mm. of the time they're just students and, you know, they're drinking beer, they're having a good time. But it is important because those young students are people that we will inevitably be working with in the future. And I want them to feel that warmth, feel that sort of, you know, that umbrella comfort feeling from us as a way of saying we will look after you the feedback that I've got and I've done a few artist surveys and they feed you know how I approach different things I'll ask them you know tell us an experience about working with the gallery and 
a lot of artists feel really let down. They've had mm. work damaged, they haven't been paid on time and they feel neglected. A lot of galleries will roll out the red carpet for the, you know, for the, the grads straight after their show. But then after, you know, a year or so, they'll just sort of... Yeah. yeah. The community aspect really, really sort of is part of, I think, why we we are doing well as a business because it's what people buy into it's anti-digital mm. your approach feels very fresh and but how do you see yourself in the gallery world where do you see blue shop cottage do you see it as part of that or not at all, I don't, really? this is this is a question i've been asking myself recently because of we're about to change into a bigger space and we're going to have you know sexy floors and sexy lights it's quite interesting sort of and i'm an overthinker and you know details are everything to me and it's sort of thinking about that. And I don't know is the answer. All I know is we are quite transparent, unlike a lot of galleries. We are genuinely nurturing. You know, inevitably a lot of these amazing people will become friends. I've got sort of endless notes written, sort of pinned up all over the house. And people keep saying, oh, you do things so differently. And it's sort of, it's sometimes hard for me to think, what, 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 why do we do things differently? Like, what is it that we do differently? But I think it's just a genuine, authentic sort of extension of me as a person and how I've been brought up and my beliefs mm -hmm. and, you know, chatting to artists that they feel isolated, they feel unnurtured, they feel lonely, they lack confidence, so they need encouragement. So we want to create a space which does that. Obviously, for the solo shows, we, you know, we will market the hell out of the solo show and we want to make those sales and sales are incredibly important but it's the longer stories that are sort of also interesting you know I mentioned earlier that we will meet you know a young painter so recently we met two young painters here at Blue Shop they came to every show and eventually you're like come on then show me your work <laughs> and you see their work you're like wow these guys are incredible and you go and see this you know you go to the studio they're now going to do a show with us next year and and it's in that moment, again, that you think, and that's the importance. That's the importance of making sure these guys can come and have a beer, come and talk talk, yeah. talk about work. And and I think that that is different to a lot of the galleries. Well, like, you definitely get the impression that they're just pandering to sales and mm. their clients and the artists that mm -hmm. will sell the mm. most, the mm -hmm. most popular work. Mm. Um, but you've got sort of more a longer view of mm. cultivating these relationships with yeah. artists right so they're right at the beginning of their careers mm. with you yeah is that the case for all your artists so most of our artists i would say nine out of ten this is their first solo show here and i think that's something that we feel really like that's really important to us that we've kind of been that first step in in their career like hopefully we then go on to work with them continually um alice hartley had a she started off and works on paper which is our online show where we're able to sell you know to show 200 works at a time which we don't have the capacity to do that here in the gallery for anyone who's been at sort of a four by four meter space <laughs> she had her first solo show back at the beginning of the year and we're now sort of sitting in her second solo show of the year so you know working with them at the beginning is a great thing for us because we're able to guide them we get to do, you know, we do photo shoots with them. So we take, you know, these beautiful um, photographs yes. of them. And I think that sort of leads on to another thought that is, I went to see a talk by Kate Bryan on female artists and how we can kind of keep them in the canon of artists. How do we mm. keep them there? Yeah. And one of the things she said, and she's quite right, is that by documenting them, so the images that you take, the articles that are written... So we think, we believe that it's really important. The press, okay, press may lead to sales, but more importantly, it will sort of deepen the roots that sort of plant these female artists and emerging artists into the, the art history, the history of art. So, so yeah, all these things are things that we're thinking about all the time. How are we making each and every artist that we work with better, like advising on their prices, advising on their photography, things like that, yeah. So when you say your motto is help artists grow, you really are helping all sides of their practice. It's not just about showing some of their works. No, it's about everything. I mean, sometimes it's to do like an artist statement, for example, and this is something that is for artists out there listening. 
I think artists feel scared and will write something that sounds good. <laughs> yes. And actually, I really don't buy into that. I think you just have to write something that's true. Mm. Most people that read art- artist statements are either curators, galleries, sure. But when it comes to sales, it's going to be a collector. And having a really succinct, beautifully written but clear artist statement is a really like concise way of telling your story so we'll work on the artist statement with them for a lot of the solo shows we'll make a process film so for example for Alice Hartley she makes monoprints to the artists out there they'll understand monoprint but to a collector certainly to a first time collector they do not know what that is a monoprint and we found that it sounds like print so digital print and actually, we want to help that. So we'll make a film. We call them mono paintings because they are mono paintings. She paints them through a screen. And we'll make a process film. So it's a lot of the time, it's about listening to them, spending time with that individual and using my skills in design and, you know, from my advertising mm. background. And instead of selling dog food, <laughs> you're, <laughs> you're creating a story around an artist. Mm. And that might be down to doing the typography, doing their invite design. You're almost sort of creating identity and a world around that artist. Yeah, it's a really interesting way of looking at it. I mean, the artists that you select must be so thrilled to have this <laughs> opportunity. How do you choose your artists? How do you find them? So this is a very good question. And it's another question that I get asked quite a lot. The truest answer is I go on gut instinct. In the past, I thought I must show work that will sell. Mm. And and in the same way, artists will approach me and say, what size painting sells? And these two things, when you're selling automobiles, maybe that is relevant. (laughs) Or dog food. Or (laughs) dog food. Or toothpaste. (laughs) You know, what flavours are... But when it comes to art, it's not the same. You know, the art has to be authentic to that artist. And I think what a gallery, what a curator does and what they should do really well is they connect an artist with the right audience. So what I'm looking for is work that I absolutely love, work that stops me in my tracks, whether that's at a degree show, whether that is on Instagram whether that's because I've met a groovy person in a pub and they're like, oh, I'm an artist, check my work out. And I look at it, I'm like, <laughs> you know, there's just, there's a this gut feeling in my belly that makes me go, oh yeah, this would be fantastic. And, you know, some shows, as, as everyone knows, are, you know, don't sell as well. Mm-hmm. But yet some of them will create such a sort of intrigue and interest around them. And you might get some fantastic press stories and actually... All of those things have real value and they add to this long story because there are lots of sort of digital online galleries out there who will just curate work that sells, but we don't believe in that. We believe in the integrity of an artist. If I feel like an artist has got a really developed practice, they're sort of immersed in it and... It just feels very true to them. Those are things that get me excited. I love doing studio visits. I mm. really do like love going to chat to people. If you get on with them, you have a sort of energy between you two. That really, really helps as well. It's quite a hard thing to pin down. Especially, I imagine, if you're going to the studio, sometimes I've found going to the studio, mm. there's just so much work to look at. Mm-hmm. Um, it's overwhelming and they're not maybe clear on exactly where the, what their direction is and they're yeah. try, experimenting so much it's sometimes hard to pick out what would work really well mm-hmm. do you find that really yeah cool? so we will do like an edit I mean generally I'll offer an artist a solo show either based just on them as an individual and their like practice at large or it'll be you know I love this series you know this will look fantastic and then we could also add in these works on paper which go well with that So it's always quite an open conversation. I know that sometimes when you're sort of adding to the inventory of a show, a gallery can be quite like, yes, no, yes, no, Mm -hmm. yes, no. But I also want the artist to feel that they use this as their way. And and I will, because because I've been doing this for a while now, I, I, I have a pretty good sense of what will sell and what won't sell. But I don't think that sort of means you should just have that because actually having a broad range of their work 
is really important just to show off their skill set. Mm. But it's always a conversation, essentially. You know, coming up with the show title, sometimes they'll come up with something which is like completely impossible to say or read or <laughs> understand. And I'll be like, okay, okay, maybe we can come up with a second version. And if they're really keen on that thing, we'll go for that thing. You know, at, at the end of the day, like um, B. Hazel Makash had a show called Akashi, which means koi um, fish in, in Japanese. And we had endless sort of people translating it for us. And I think a few people were like, that doesn't mean koi, it means sweet. Oh, no. But, oh, but, no. but, then, but then it was actually from old Japanese and it did mean koi. But it's, it's all a conversation. And that's a really important part for us. And also part of what makes it so enjoyable mm. as well is to collaborate on these shows. Yes. And I imagine the more input the artist has into their own show, the more they feel ownership over it. And then whatever happens with sales, mm. they feel as though they've yeah had that input absolutely and it's not out of their control yeah. which is stressful for artists yeah um and then so once you've agreed on the body of work do you then lead on the curation and the pricing and that side of things so we will normally do the hang together depending on if they're available that day i mean normally i ask for them to be here me and my assistants will hang the show and they'll sort of stand there or like sit on the throne and, point <laughs> and we'll go hi look hi look <laughs> Um, again, it's a complete collaboration. Like framing, for example, we do all our framing through our framers down in Broccoli. But that's also a conversation. The invite design, the typography design, the layout for the catalogue, the headshots that I take, the video. It's normally that I'll sort of put forward some options or put forward some, or even down to the song on the, on the film. Like there, I'll ask for like a few tracks and they'll send me like a Spotify playlist. And if a track doesn't work, I might say, oh, I'm not sure this is working. Like it's got the wrong sort of tempo. But all those things, there's not one part of it that isn't a conversation. And that's mm. the same with the prices as well. It's always a conversation. So it's a real collaboration. I mean, you must spend a lot of time talking to the artists if you're sharing this much information beforehand. Absolutely. I mean, that's that's really important to us that it's... You know, we're in touch with them all the time because it's their work at the end of the day. We are just acting as a sort of agent, if you will. And so the fact that it's their body of work and I want them to feel that sense of pride because also the other thing that, as we know, with being an emerging artist, being a young artist, is it's really tough. And unless that show is a positive experience, you know, they might not want to be an artist or they might sort of find it too difficult we want the shows to be such a positive experience which is again why it's so important that you know people come out in their droves and Mm -hmm. they support that individual who's essentially probably been making work (laughs) alone in a cold studio for six months to 18 months we want this this shows here to be like the beginning of a really brilliant career communication and how we're packaging up that show are essential to to yeah to what we do here and now that you've done a lot of shows you've shown lots of impressive artists and there's lots of photos on instagram about sold out and packed out shows Mm -hmm. do you ever find working with artists that they have unrealistic expectations of how the show is going to go and you have to manage those Hmm. honestly no like i always feel actually that artists I think because of their temperament, and I'm generalising here, but it's probably the same as mine. Like I've got quite a, despite being quite a sort of upbeat person, I always, I'm very highly anxious. I'll get like worried about things. But then with that sort of demeanour, so for example, the artist residency that we did, I was driving to the airport thinking, what am I doing? I'm meeting 10 young strangers. <laughs> this is going to be a disaster. But of course... It was absolutely incredible. It was almost sort of flawless. And I think, you know, artists feel nervous. They're sort of anxious. Are oh, things going to sell? Are things not going to sell? So it's almost like as soon as things sell or start selling, you know, they're so happy. And that's the joy. We sold 19 works by 12 different artists in Soho House. And you get to call these individuals and like say, hey, I've got some good news. <laughs> and like, And they're like, they start screaming (laughs) you know generally it's all good like everything that you're giving them in terms of news updates content uh, framing advice it's all such positive things which I think makes the job that is why it makes the job is so fantastic because it you're just providing such 
great people with such good news basically <laughs> all of the time and not all of the time of course but 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 most of the time mm. well I think that shows how fresh your approach is because I'm sure there's lots of galleries and this is also generalizing mm. lots of galleries that are probably not having that experience at mm. the moment so tell me more about your residencies because that looked amazing yeah so the first one we ever did actually was at, um 10 years ago and this was before I had an art gallery but um again like I mentioned earlier I sort of always doing things with artists and actually a lot of my mates were at Camberwell and from this house that I used to live in in Camden we'd like auditioned people because we wanted it to be like this creative commune it was like <laughs> so funny if anyone wants to see images I can like share them there. so we were very very sort of sincere and earnest it was adorable but yeah I was 20 23 or something and um and off we went to Ireland my family have a house in Ireland and the plan was that we'd make work in the environment for two weeks and everything would be paid for and then we'd like keep the, the art for the house. It was the start of Help Artists Grow, basically. That, it was that first experience, I think, of organising something where you, using my confidence, I suppose, um, and also resources... It was the first time where I saw these people flourish. And the first day of that residency, everyone came in and they were sort of fresh from art school, 22-year-olds, sitting on their laptops. They were just frozen. We closed the laptops. And I was like, right, guys, I can take you to the beach. We can take you to the mountains. We've got materials here. We've got a guy on site making canvases. Tell me what you want. And that moment was sort of what really sparked all these following things anyway 10 years later I'm finally organized another one and I was approached by a wonderful collector actually who lives up the road called Tanya and Tanya's background is in sculpture and holistic therapy which is perfect for residency (laughs) and we set about planning this 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 week long well nine days actually week long residency well we had I think 90 submissions we interviewed 15 people and we, we wanted to take eight originally, but we took 10 artists out to France. And the idea was that it would be a structured week. So breakfast, lunch and dinner were all at set times. So people would come together, we'd chat and then you could make work. We'd have artists run workshops once a day. And I have to say it was the most wonderful week ever and sort of quite a proud moment. Those individuals, um, have now become great friends and just seeing them flourish and share ideas, share materials. I think we just gave them this real life space that that art schools, for for whatever reason, are sort of at the moment failing on. You know, artists feel isolated. They don't get these opportunities to meet with real people. So it's hardly surprising that they've all made best friends. Yeah. (laughs) Because, you know, it was a new thing for them. And and my feeling is that art, art schools should be doing that and again it sort of played back into you know what are we doing what are we what's blue shop all about it's about real life opportunities and experiences so you know we really really feel passionate about that and we've got um, a group show of all their work coming up in 2022 oh great Mm -hmm. so what when you were interviewing them or you were looking through the applications what were you looking for so the main thing we were looking for I think was a real conviction to their work we did look at the work initially that's kind of what got people to the interview we did interviews on zoom which was absolutely brilliant so we were looking at the work thinking is this going to work in a, in a group we wanted to have different people with different sort of practices different approaches also different levels of experience i guess so we had some who've exhibited here and we know well and then we had others who have never been to art school. We had some in sculpture, some in painting, some in drawing, some in collage. So you wanted to put together a group of artists that were all really different. But when we chatted to people, I think it was about an energy. Yeah. It was about a confidence in their work. So the people that maybe didn't get into the residency, maybe they weren't quite ready. We were also asking them to commit to commit to this week and we didn't want people dropping out and we wanted people to feel that they were really there and they wanted to be there which was actually in the end hence why we went from eight to ten you know it was so 
it was easy, relatively easy um, to, to do so. And, and we were so thrilled with the group mm-hmm. we chose. Then um, they all got on well and oh my God, inspired each other. So well, I had to remove myself at like 1 a.m. every night because they were all <laughs> dancing around like hooligans. Oh. I was having the best time. And I was like, I'm the grown up here. I've been, even though, like, you know, some, one of them was older than me and another one was like, only a few years younger than me. But um, yeah, it was it was love. It was a lovely, lovely thing to see because I know how crucial those positive moments can be. Like when one looks back at their creative life, certainly mine, and you know, having discussed with others, there are a few points which kind of encourage you. They make you keep going. They sort of make you work harder, dig deeper, because you realise what you have, and that you know, having an art practice and an art, artist-based community are such fantastic, enriching things. So I hope that people, that, that the 10 artists on that residency and, and indeed the seven on the one in 2011 look back at those moments and think that was a really like crucial time. Well, it sounds like it really inspired you as well. But to go back to you and your vision for it, um, are you an artist yourself? Do you have your own practice? So I trained in fashion I basically was always like such a like a a sort of hard working person at, on my art um, foundation. I like used to sleep in the art school, <laughs> and it's the same when I was at school. Like I was always sort of top of the class, being a sort of nerd. <laughs> but I think the difference with me and the artists is that I've always been across the board of things. Mm-hmm. I'm interested in loads of different things, and. I think when I, like, I fell in love with branding and design because it was about this narrative and I've always been obsessed with stories. And I watched this film, Beautiful Losers, which I talk about all the time. People are so sick of me talking about it. But if anyone hasn't heard it or or seen it, I'm sure we can link it in the podcast. Yeah, absolutely. Because you can watch it on YouTube for free. Yeah. And this film, infused with whiskey and potentially other things, changed my life. And it basically spoke about this one space in New York. It's about these unbelievably awesome illustrators, photographers, skaters, punks in New York City and how they became this family and there was this gallery space and the skate park and that physical space became something that was their sort of home. And having come from a family where my family are very creative you know they're more design to interior design and product design but it always has been more appealing for me to create a space rather than be the artist and so whilst I think my character is quite similar so I always get on very well with artists because we have the same sort of I don't know just the same personalities in a way even though I'm probably a bit more like I don't know commercial I guess mm. But, so no, I don't have an art practice. I sort of dream of painting and I do paint and I draw a lot and I do lots of life drawing. But I've always been different to the artist in terms of like my makeup, I think. Mm. Mm. And you have a background in design, which you can clearly see from, as you say, the design of the materials that you produce and even the um, the look of the the gallery space. Yeah, so my background is design. So I went from... Central St. Martin's doing fashion. I then went and worked for some amazing... Christopher Rayburn, who's an incredible menswear designer. Christiana Williams, who is an incredible illustrator now. She had a store um, called Beyond the Valley. I was helping her with illustration and design, but I didn't have any practical graphic design skills. So I went to Australia and then worked for MTV doing art direction when I was like 21. And then got... When I came back to London, went into advertising and branding like hardcore and I loved it like I still love it I still love designing business cards designing (laughs) it's like creating typography for Dominic McHenry's show that like reflected the curve of his sculpture like I love all those details like doing the films that we now do for the artists and I think that is what I really love it's a really good skill set to apply to shows like I do see some show I mean some galleries are like unbelievable their design they have incredible designers working with them but like some like don't so much and I think it really does help like Mm -hmm. when you're trying to tell a story of an artist and put out a like a really like gorgeous 
um, identity for a show I think those things are so important I feel very lucky that I get to do them and I like get a kind of cheap thrill when I like find the right typeface I'm like, <laughs> oh yeah <laughs> well I suppose lots of galleries have their own identity as a gallery but then they, they wouldn't mm. create a story or an identity mm. for each artist mm. so your approach is so thorough mm. and as you say it sounds like it's really in, engaging and fun for you as well as the gallery owner So you have all this background in design, but then at the beginning of our conversation, you mentioned that you saw this space, it was completely derelict, and you had to tackle that as a challenge. I mean, that's just a completely different way of thinking and working. So at that point, did you feel that your vision was strong enough that you were just going to go for it? I mean, how did you get over the anxiety around that? Well, at that point, when I found the space, I was looking for just for a home. There was no sense of gallery at all at that point. So in 2016, when I bought this shop house, I just thought, you know, it was a live work. And I, I couldn't quite gauge like what bit had to, you know, could we, could I ever have a dinner party in the living room, or in the front <laughs> yes. room, like what's possible? Did you ever do that? Um, well, yeah, we do that now, actually. And I don't, you know, if, if the head of Southwark is listening, you know, turn, turn this <laughs> off. Um, but, you know, the gallery happens so accidentally. It just so happens that this sort of gallery space, um, which is, if, if anyone hasn't been here, it's got sort of a front, um, a glass frontage so people can see in beautifully. It's got gorgeous, like, natural light. Mm. And it is just really welcoming. Like, the frontage mm. is is very, like happy isn't it yes the red and white awning I've had the red and white awning replaced because the old one was was very horrid and I kept having to retouching it in in photoshop um but it's 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 a really sort of positive smiley front so then we do I think we had I mean we did loads of gigs actually so we used to have loads of musicians coming in here we'd had cocktail bar we had a bike shop we had um, a florist you know all these different things that all these like gorgeous happy shop setups and actually then when we did the first one with art you know it was such an easy go-to because I you know I've got so many artist friends I love obviously love art myself and it just lent itself so well to an art gallery. And I think it's because I went about it that way. I think maybe if I'd had a gallery assistant background, I might not have gone, gone in so sort of gung-ho because mm. there's no denying that this gallery looks different to your average gallery. You know, the walls are like a warm grey green. We've got wooden floorboards. There's benches. There's things growing in the, you know, people can help themselves to mint and tomatoes and beans. <laughs> in the spring and but but I think that is again who I am and who my dad is for example and you know how I've grown up and I think that's why that's why it is that way Mm -hmm. but yeah it's a very much an accident and I love how I didn't really realize this until I actually came to the space you walk through the doors and your home is just right there (laughs) it really gets people sometimes sometimes if I've had like a glass of wine I'm like and I live there as if this and then um, it's sort of the lion witch in the wardrobe yeah. um, uh, thing. But I think that's, again, that's... I listened to uh, a brilliant podcast with Sadie Coles and she was talking about that kind of, that magic of a space. And in order for artists to be excited about showing the space, they want that space to be exciting. Mm. And I think the physicality of me living in here is sort of a way of showing my conviction to the artist. The fact that I literally sleep here, <laughs> in here, is, is you know, that's, that it's, it, I couldn't be more um, passionate about what I do here. And whilst that might not be the same forever, in starting a business, it's certainly been a great way to, to start a business because it means, you know, the, the walk to work is very quick. <laughs> <laughs> well, it sounds, I mean, we're recording at the end of 2021. Well, this will be going out early next year, but it sounds though you've got some big plans for the future, for the space itself, mm-hmm. which is really exciting. My last question really would be, what advice do you have for artists that are listening to this podcast, listening to you speaking so passionately about working with them? And if they would love to work with you or at least work towards that point of working with someone like you what advice would you have the answer is not clear Mm. you know because I I think how people stumble across artists is there's no you know algebraic way of saying it's this plus this equals this but what I would say 
to any artists out there is if you feel that you love making work, then give it everything. I appreciate, you know, for lots of emerging artists, they have to have jobs alongside those things. But keep perspective on, like, what the end goal is. You know, if you can't afford a studio, can you make some space in your home to dedicate some time to making that work? The other thing is documenting that work. For gallery, for galleries, for curators, we have little time. You know, we work, all work, all the time, 24-7, pretty much. So when we do stumble across you, whether that's your website or your Instagram, make sure those images are really, really clear and sharp. The third thing is, you know, get out there into the world of, you know, you might live in Wales in a village, you might live by the sea and don't know the, any other artists. But the great thing about the internet is, you know, use it, use it as a tool. I see too often artists sort of dedicating their life to their Instagram and talking about the algorithm. Oh, yeah, it's so hard. Which, and, and I, I appreciate the algorithms. I mean, I don't really, haven't really thought about the, the algorithm. I just think that you just need to focus on your work because that is the most important thing and sort of your narrative, basically. And get out there, like, come up to London, come up to these shows. A lot of these emerging artist shows are completely free. You'll get a free drink. <laughs> you know, come and chat to people because... Actually, that is how a lot of these relationships happen. Mm. If I see that there's a young artist at Blue Shop every show and they turn up and they're engaging, that makes me think you're committed. And galleries, at the end of the day, they want to they wanna show fantastic work. They want to work with hardworking people. And, and that's, that's, sort of, that's what they're looking for. So I think, you know, art school might be affordable for some it might not for others so I would say look for residencies there are lots of incredible residencies out there which are heavily subsidized by grants and I mean someone was telling me that they're doing one in Mexico or something and it's like sort of 300 pounds a month Pada is this incredible residency out in Portugal yes yeah which if you're at a stage where you have a flat you can sublet your flat I think it's I think they said it was 900 pounds for the whole month which for some, that might be out of their budget, but for others, that's affordable. So, and at the end of the day, if you ever want to ask, um, get in touch, you know, you can always pop us an email, pop us a message. We do ask people to send their portfolios to us. We can't get back to everyone, but if we mm. see fantastic work, we will work with people that way. So yeah, I think it's just putting yourself out there, both physically and digitally in the best way possible. Great. Oh, that was packed with advice. Thank you. <laughs> Um, it has been so lovely to sit in your beautiful space and talk to you about yeah, artists. Yeah, well, thanks for coming. Thank you so much. Thank you for listening this week. Please follow Blue Shop Cottage on Instagram at Blue Shop Cottage and of course the podcast at The Visible Artist Podcast. Thank you for rating and reviewing on Apple Podcasts. It means so much and it really does help boost the podcast in the charts. Next week, I'll be back with another very talented artist. So stay tuned and download next Friday. <laughs>